Blessed morning to everyone. Welcome to our morning worship service. Let's sing Dwelling in Beulah Land. Thank you today for giving us such wonderful opportunity once again to stand here to listen to your word. Father, we thank you for what you have done in our life in the past, present, and in the future what you have done in our lives. Father, we pray that your word is coming. Give us a good heart, a tender heart to listen to your word. And let us not only listen to your head in vain, but apply your word in truth. Father, I also pray for the one coming to preach. Give him the wisdom. Give him the insight so that you preach your word according to your will. In this, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. They could not find their way. Then they awoke the Master, saying, Lord, please save us now. He rebuked the winds, and the sea grew calm, and they all wondered how. God sees the storm from the other side. He knows the Learned. And just beyond the clouds, he sees clear skies. He speaks peace to the raging storm when peace could not be found. He already sees the rainbow. When we see only 
clouds Like the man on the sea did I have called God in prayer When it seemed to me all hope was gone And in my deep despair I remembered what the Lord said When He calmed the troubled sea And I know once more how He sees the storm And peace flies over me Sees the storm from the other side. He knows the lessons learned, and just beyond the clouds, he sees the clear skies. He speaks peace to the raging storm, but peace could not be found. He already sees the rainbow. When we see only cloud Oh, and when the storms of life Come crashing in And they trouble me I can feel God's arms around me And He whispers Let it be Let it be the lessons learned, and just beyond the clouds he sees his clear sky. Oh, he speaks peace to the raging storm, where peace could not be found. He already sees the rainbow, when we see only Happy Lord's Day. Good morning to all, and may God grant you blessings and protection um, even as we live through this week. Uh, let's continue to pray for Pastor Boyd and each other, and uh, there is a progress uh, that, uh, that Pastor Boyd is going is, is, um, is going through. So we see him uh, increasing in his strength, and we see him also uh, able to walk. Uh, able to walk. And so let's continue to pray that his wounds would heal. And let's not forget to pray for each other. Some of our members are going through difficult times. Some are going through financial difficulties. So let's uh, pray that God will sustain them in this time of crisis. We live in times where truth is hard to find. It's not only because we are living in postmodern era where the idea of absolute truth is rejected, but because of falsehood being advertised as true. Fake news has been with us at almost unprecedented scale. There are keyboard warriors, trolls, who are getting paid just to make fake news and to make sure that truth will be suppressed. In this spiritual arena, things are not even better. False prophets and false teachers of all stripes have arisen, and they are bringing in their poisonous teaching at audience who do not have spiritual discernment. These false teachers are taking advantage of their audience financially, physically, and worst of all, spiritually. Their followers also share their, will share in their condemnation unless they repent and believe. The main thing that we will learn today is because God has warned us of the coming and the character and the objective of false teachers, let us take heed to it. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? 
Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we pray, O oh God, that uh, we will learn from the passage that you have uh, given us. I pray, O oh God, that uh, through our study, through your word, we will be warned of the seriousness of the false teachers who are already here among us. I know we pray, O oh God, that uh, you will you will give us wisdom and discernment, even as we study your word, so that we will not only be one, but we will also be able to warn others. And this was in prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue our study in the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. All of the things that Peter have said is coming now to its purpose. He, in the first chapter, he encouraged them. He told them about the infinite divine resources that they already have. And also, he, uh, he told them, he encouraged them to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that they would be able to have discernment and wisdom and stability that they would not be swayed away by the false teachers. And of course, the foundation for all of this is then other than the Word of God. And last meeting we have, we have discussed the authority, the finality, and the clarity of the Word of God so that, uh, so that we will not be swayed by the false teachers. So let's read the passage that we will uh, study today. We are, we are going to read the first three pa passages of Second Peter chapter 2. But there are false prophets also among the people. Even there shall be false teachers among you who privately or secretly bring damnable, damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious or sensual ways. By the reason of them, the way of truth shall be evilly spoken of. And through covetousness, they, they with faint words make merchandise of you, whose judgment of now of long time lingereth not, and the damnation slumbereth not. May God add a, a blessing on the reading of his word. We have already prayed, and let's continue now with our, with our passage. In this passage, there are three, four things that I would like to show you. The first is the prediction of the false teacher. Second, their purpose, their popularity, and also the procedure by which they repropagate uh, their error and take advantage of the people. The first thing that we will learn is that the prediction regarding the coming of the false teachers. In the first, in the first verse, this is what we will read. But there were false prophets also among the people, even there shall be false teachers among you who privately or secretly bring in damnable heresies, denying the Lord that brought them, denying the Lord that brought them. The first thing that we will study here in verse 1 is this, the prediction regarding the false teachers. If one thing that abounds today in the spiritual realm, it is none other than the presence of false teachers. This is nothing new. Just as false prophets arose in the Old Testament times, so are false teachers and false prophets have appeared today and have done damage to the world. Moses, under the old covenant, have warned, of the children, warned the children of Israel of the false prophets that will lead them astray. Moses described them in his, described their modus operandi and what to do with them. With them. Deuteronomy chapter 13 verses 1 to 5 tells us this, tells the children of Israel as well. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams that giveth thee a good sign and wonder, the sign or wonder 
shall come to pass whereof he shall speak unto thee, Let us go after the gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments, obey his voice. Ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet and that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the hands of house of bandage to trust thee out into to trust out the way which the Lord thy God has be, uh, commanded thee to walk thou shalt put that evil way from the midst of thee so here Paul uh, Peter is telling them and as he was he recounting what Moses said that these children of Israelites were to put away the false prophets that were among them, and that shall not give audience to them. Well, some of them may claim to speak in God's name, but God really hadn't sent them. Moses gave them clear directives in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 20 to 22. But the prophets which shall presume to speak in my name, which I have commanded him to speak, or that shall I speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die, if he say, say in thine heart, how shall we know the words which the Lord hath spoken, when the prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, and the thing follow not, or nor came to pass, that thing which the Lord hath not spoken, the prophet hath spoken presumptuous, presumptuously, and thou shalt not be afraid of him. This is the test of the fall of the fall of God's prophet that there is 100% accuracy in their prophecy or prediction. This is a far cry from modern prophets and false teachers today. Most of the false prophets, most of their prediction has not happened, and if anything have happened, it is probably by chance. In this passage, Peter warned Christians of the false teachers that will arise who will bring in destructive heresies. Peter was not speaking out of the vacuum because he heard it first from Jesus himself. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warned them, saying, Beware of false prophets which shall come to you in, so for in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall in enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. For many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, we have, not, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we cast out devils? And in thy name has done many wonderful works? Then, uh, and then I will pro profess unto them, I knew you, I, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Even in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Jesus said, Many false prophets shall rise and, may, and shall deceive many, and there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show, show shine, sign, great signs and wonders, in so much that if it were possible, they shall de deceive the very elect. So, why should we be concerned about the false prophets and their teaching? It is because of the clandestine way they have infiltrated into the church. From Peter's wording, we can deduce that they have presented themselves as part of the church, as believers. Uh, and they hid the true nature of their doctrinal identity and pose as orthodox teachers. Once they have gotten inside the fellowship of believers, they will secretly sow discord and false doctrine among believers by undermining the doctrinal foundation of the church. Now, how do we prepare from such onslaught of false teachers that have already arrived? In the previous chapter, we will read his, this, uh, this application and this exhortation. First, we must have full confidence 
of the authority, sufficiency, efficacy, and clarity, and the finality of God's word. We must never stray from its truth, no matter how appealing the alternatives the false teachers are offering. Paul also warned the Ephesian pastors about the false teachers that will arise upon his departure. He gave them, he gave them also warning that will guard them from false teachers. From, from Acts chapter 20 verses 21 to 32, and I will read only in verse 32. And, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which are able to build you up and to give you inheritance among them that are sanctified. It is the word of God and our confidence in it that will bring stability to us as believers. The second thing that we must do is to grow in our Christian virtues, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which will bring stability and discernment that will make us less likely victims of these false teachers. We must take uh, the threat of false teachers seriously because they have eternal consequences. We must also take the threat of, we must also treat the teaching of sound doctrine as of first priority. This will be our first line of defense against false teaching. The second, we will also learn from the passage that we have read the purpose of the false teachers. They shall privately or secretly bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them. The reason why these false teachers were successful are successful also. It's because they do not reveal their true colors. They present themselves as ministers of Christ and will show token allegiance to him. They will preach what is popular and will steer away from subjects that are offensive to the unregenerate mind. Regarding the content of their teaching, Bible teacher Rob Salvato comments, and this, his statement are very insightful. When it comes to the church today, there are some who feed their flock that amounts to spiritual ice cream and cotton candy. These are feel-good sermon whose aim is to make people happy and help them feel good about themselves. Isn't that familiar? Second, sermons that will never convict, confront, and be challenged. Although the congregation is happy, they are not healthy. Thirdly, there will other spiritual movements who feed their congregation or followers what's amo what amounts to poison, causing their con congregation to never come to life but remain dead in their sin. So they will be selective in what they will preach. And they will, in, they will induce spiritual poison to them. A.W. Uh, a. Criswell explains how these false teachers operate. False teachers as a suave, affable, personal, personable, scholarly man who claims to be a friend of Christ. He preaches in the pulpit, writes learned books, and publishes articles in the religious magazine. He attacks Christianity from within. He makes the Church of God and the school of a lodging place for every unclean and hateful bird. He leavens the meal with the doctrine of the Sadducees. So he secretly brings in false teaching. William MacDonald also far, further describes the false teachers take their place inside the church. Inside, inside the church. As, and they pose as ministers of the gospel. This was make them, um, the, the peril so great. They come right out, right out and say that they, uh, if they would come right out and present themselves as atheists or agnostic, the people will be on guard. But they are masters of deception. They carry Bible and use orthodox expression. Uh, though, you, though using them, uh, they mean different things. 
The president of a liberal, liberal theological seminary acknowledged this strategy as follows. Churches often change doctrinal conviction without forma, formally renouncing their views which they have previously committed. Their theologians usually find a way of preserving continuity with a pass of reinterpretation. This false teacher will teach aspect of the truth in order to accommodate what they really believe in. The doctrines that they will in introduce are not harmless. Peter describes them as describes them as damnable heresies, which means destructive even to the point of perdition or condemnation. Their appearance of orthodoxy is only superficial because they didn't uh, is only superficial. Why are, they, why are they preaching destructive? It is because that they deny the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. This teaching abounds today in the form of what is known as the easy believism. It is the belief system that denies the importance of receiving Jesus Christ as Lord as part of saving faith. They make a separation of Jesus as Savior and Jesus as Lord. Jude adds a layer by explaining that these people pervert the grace of God by turning it into lasciviousness. We must remember that in the scripture there are 700 references to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And there are 24 references to Jesus Christ being our Savior. Furthermore, in Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10, it states that confessing of Jesus as Lord is part of saving faith that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe with thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. While these people appear to have a seeming high view of grace, they inevitably pervert it by turning it into lasciviousness because they forgot the sanctifying aspect of grace. The grace that saves us also sanctifies us. The grace that saves us help us to say no to ungodliness and worldly lust and to say yes to godliness, sobriety, and also righteousness and holiness. If one claims to be saved by grace and there is no evidence of its sanctifying person, then that person has never been saved by grace. The danger of easy believism is that it is immunized because of its immunizing effect on people from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lordship of Christ is not an optional nor a peripheral doctrine. It is an important aspect of saving faith. Recognition of Jesus Christ as Lord means that we acknowledge His deity and His worship as well also as His finished work. Those things are inseparably united. Those who reject and deny this teaching, uh, those people who believe in that teaching deny really the gospel. Our passage issues a solemn warning that they bring unto themselves swift destruction. At the end of days, all, of the, all, of, all creation, whether in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Right now, let us confess him as Lord with our might, least we will, uh, we will co confess him as Lord, but now of receiving him as Lord, but in concession because we have been condemned to eternal damnation. Lastly, the popularity, uh, the, thirdly, the popularity of these false teachers. Why are these false teachers popular? It is because the message they give, give allowance to the last and unregenerate heart. The phrase many will follow means that a great number of nominal Christians will yield or conform or imitate or accept these false teachers. Because of the great number that will follow them, it will give an appearance of God's blessing upon them. 
It is tragic that many will run after these false teachers and cover their conduct. The word pernicious in this passage is translated from the Greek word aselgeia, which means licentious or without moral restraint. It is the lifestyle that is lived in open and lewd sexual immorality. These false teachers are also posed using their ministry as fishing ground so that they could catch unsuspecting victims in order that they would fulfill their lust. They are successful at spotting, uh, willing and easy victims because their targets are people who, looks for, who look for teachers who will stifle their conscience, accommodate their lusts, and tickle their ears. Because of the scandalous lifestyle, lifestyle of this false teacher, the way of truth will be greatly maligned. Why? Because, the, because there are because that the sins, because the sins that the people commit, who proclaim the name of Christ, create a greater damage to the cause of the gospel. Now, isn't it? Uh, has someone? Ha, have you ever experienced sharing the gospel with someone and that person will point you to somebody you know as a cause why they do not accept the gospel? Isn't it embarrassing that they have produced a reason for not believing in Christ? Or somebody pointed to you of a scandal committed by a famous TV evangelist who have fallen into sexual scandal. Instances such as this will make people reject Christ and his gospel because they say no difference in conduct for those who profess Christ and those who do not. The name of Christ became a laughing stock to these people. How do we prevent this shipwreck in our lives? As people who have been called to salvation, let us remember with great earnestness our call. Let us not do anything that will bring dishonor to Christ. By the power of the new life within us, coming from the Holy Spirit who is abiding in us, with the word of God sanctifying us, we can demonstrate and testify to the people that we are indeed his people. Lastly, the procedure of this false teacher. Let us read verse 3. Uh, and through covetousness, they shall with fain words make merchandise of you, whose judgment of uh, now of a long time lingereth not, and, them their, and their damnation, uh, and, their damn, and their damnation slumbereth not. These false teachers are not only sensual, but they are also greedy. The allure of power and the lust for sensual pressures are the driving forces why they are in the ministry. They do not care for the souls of the people, nor for the truth, nor for the gospel, or for God. If ever they would care for the people, it is not for the people per se, but what they have in their wallets and in their purses. These slick teachers use shameless ways and manipulative tactics to get money from their people so they could fulfill their cravings, their luxurious lifestyles, and their vices. How can this false teacher maneuver their way into the people's pocket and into their bank accounts? First, they use girl tripping and peer pressure. They make pe people feel guilty of not giving all their money to the church or to them. Let us remember that the scriptures have already set guidelines for giving. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 and 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 and 2. These are the guidelines by which God has given us with regards to giving. Enforced giving are not sanctioned by the scripture and should never be mandatory to the members. But these false teachers equate their own authority with the authority of God so that giving to them is equal to giving to God. Some religious charlatan require members to secure for them large property holdings, large bank account, palatial mansion, top-of-the-line fleet of cars, and luxurious yachts, 
personal airports and private jets. Can you just imagine those? Can you just imagine that? You may think that I am exaggerating, but this have happened. They are justifying it by saying that these comforts are necessary so that it would reflect God's glory in his teachers. Even unsaved people will react with revulsions at such misuse of God's authority, but the greed of these people have blinded them from reality. While the members are giving all their money, some of them are even suffering, giving the last of their money, they're not getting spiritual nourishment from their religious leader. All they get are high pressure guilt tripping. And this is sometimes mistaken for conviction of the Holy Spirit. The second reason why they are successful is because they are adept at misusing the scripture as a pretext for their greed. The common practice is that they would by this undisciplined and unprincipled preacher is that they would use a scripture out of context for forgiving even though the context shows otherwise to those who have not been taught and the proper handling of the scriptures and sound doctrine this mishandling of doctrines works every time because it gives an appearance of biblical support thirdly there is a non-stop and ever-increasing increasing pressure for projects that gives them enough reason and motivation to continuously give. For example, a religious leader may embark on building projects or, ad, or any other projects in the name of the church. But in reality, once those things have been purchased or acquired in the legal documents, it will appear that the, that the pastor or the religious owner, uh, that the religious leader is the owner and not the church. The members were continually burdened at this financial obligation be, because they have nothing left for themselves. Because, this COVID, because of these covetous teachers, the Lord's name is maligned and people are hurt and many reject the gospel because of these frauds who claim to represent him. Covetousness has no place in the ministry. Paul in his letter to Timothy reminds him that a pastor must never be a lover of money. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. As one of the requirements for pastor. And also in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 to 11, this is what we will read. But they that will be rich shall fall into temptation and snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have ha, cobe, with, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and purged themselves through with many sorrows. But thou man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount says this, No man can serve two masters. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one or love the other, or else he will alter the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. As preachers, let us fix our eyes on God who loves us and has given his son for us, for our salvation. And this is not only true for preachers, but this is also true for every believer. Because Christ should be our greatest treasure and our supreme delight. This is a serious warning that we must take heed to. Remember that the gospel is not for sale. It is for free because uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has already accomplished our salvation on the cross of Calvary. You cannot buy it. You cannot, uh, you cannot even uh, work for it. The Bible says that for by grace, we ha you have been saved through faith and death out of ourselves. It is the gift of God so that anyone would, would boast 
If we are going to pay for our salvation, it is beyond what we could pay. Even if we would own all the riches of the world and in the universe, it can never purchase our salvation. It is impossible for any person to accomplish it. But God had sent His only begotten Son into the world and has taken our nature. He became like us so that He could die for our sin. And He, still, he is also God. He retained His deity so that He could bear the full wrath of, of sin for, in our place. So the Son of God lived a perfect life, suffered a sacrificial death there on the cross. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And this is the only thing that could save you. By believing on, on what he has accomplished there on the cross of Calvary as a, for, as a payment and forgiveness for our sin. If you would repent of your sin, turn to God and receive him by faith, the Bible says that you will be saved. Now, I have a question to ask. Can God save false teachers? Yes, He can. And God, this, and God in His grace has shown, will have shown us these warnings. And later, as we would continue with the passage later on, we will see that God has issued this warning as part of His common grace. So that even the false teacher would come to, to their senses and receive him as Savior. He can save. He can. He will if people would repent. Such is the story of Costi Him. And if you have the prosperity teacher, Benny Him. He was born in the family of uh, he was born in the family of people who hold on to the notorious and who are notorious purveyors of this false gospel. According to Costi Him, according to his account, during my teenage years, he would he would travel nearly twice a month with my uncle, Benny Hinn. Prosperity theology paid amazing, amazingly well. He lived in 10,000 square foot mansion, guarded by a private gate, drove two Mercedes-Benz vehicles, uh, and vacationed in exotic destination, shop in the most expensive store, and on the top of that, we bought a two million ocean view, two million dollars ocean view, home in Dana Point, California, where another Benz joined the fleet. We were abundantly, quote and unquote, blessed. But he witnessed the inconsistencies with what we teach, with what they teach and what the scripture teaches. He was also troubled when he saw people who are not really healed. And, the, uh, and, this, and these people get the blame. Because according to the false teachers, they are not held because they lack, they lack faith. But the word of God spoke to Benny Him. Several passages in the scripture spoke to him and opened his eyes. He realized his sinf sinful condition before God and repented of his sin and trusted Jesus Christ alone as his savior. Right now he is pastoring a church, a Bible church in Orange County, California. If God can save a person deep into false teaching, he can save anyone who would believe in him. It is why we have our confidence in the word of God and the Holy Spirit to work in the hearts of sinners. Let us not get tired of praying for people nor preaching the gospel to them because it is our only hope, it is our only foundation against the false teaching who have already arisen today. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come to your presence, and O oh Lord, we ask for your, for your word that I was preached today to come and work in the hearts of the people for believers that we will have the confidence in your word so that we will not be swayed by false teachers and also that we will take the threat of the false teachers seriously. So that, O oh God, uh, we would seriously study the doctrines that will stabilize us in the faith. And help, O oh God, our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones, who are deep into the clutches of false teaching, 
Help them, O oh God, that they would be able to see your truth and that your Holy Spirit, O oh God, would work in their hearts so that they would be delivered from, the, from their error, from the condemnation that awaits them. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.